American cartoonist Jimmy Hatlow was born in East Providence, Rhode Island, to Scottish immigrant parents in 1897. But when he was still a child, the family moved to Los Angeles. In 1918, he relocated to San Francisco and worked for the city's call bulletin newspaper. Hatlow was initially employed as a general studio artist, but his evident talent for humour quickly led to both editorial and sports cartoon work. In 1929, a shipment of panels from syndicated cartoonist Tad Dorgan failed to arrive in the mail. And in an understandable panic, Hatlow's bosses asked him if he could quickly create something which would fill what would otherwise have been blank space. The result was They'll Do It Every Time, which was a series of cartoons which made good-natured fun of the foibles of American society, and it became popular almost instantly. The pressure of turning them around quickly and regularly led Hatlow to conclude that he needed help with new topics for the feature. He hit on the idea that the series could involve the readers and invited them to submit their own ideas. This made the cartoon even more popular and from the thousands that were subsequently submitted, Hatlow picked the best and credited each contributor by name. The call bulletin was owned by William Randolph Hearst King Features Syndicate, and Hatlow's creation was published successfully across the USA on this interactive basis up to his death. And its success extended to book formatted compilations which also sold in large numbers. His second great success, Little Iodine, was created as a spin-off comic strip featuring a mischievous little girl of that name who had earlier appeared in other contexts. And she became a firm favourite with the American public in strip format, which was also syndicated for years to come, as well as her own successful series of comic books and even a 1946 live-action film adaptation. In 1945, Hatlow relocated to Cartmel, California, and by the 1950s, his work was being syndicated in around 400 newspapers worldwide. In 1953, he also created another cartoon concept titled The Hatlow Inferno, which comically depicted life in hell. And although never as successful as They'll Do It Every Time or Little Iodine, it nevertheless ran successfully for five years up to 1958. In later life, Jimmy Hatlow had a series of significant health issues, and although his work continued to be published, he wasn't able to generate any new material. And following hospitalisation for a kidney disorder, he died of a stroke in 1963 at the age of 66. Fritz Cradle was born in Mickelstadt im Odenwald in Germany in 1900 and following his studies at the Offenbach School of Art and Design in Munich he began his career in illustration while simultaneously teaching there in order to provide a steady income. From the outset of his career the bulk of Cradle's output was for book illustration and he gained a reputation for both his plausibly medievally styled woodcuts and line and watercolour wash images. In 1934 he moved to Frankfurt and worked there until 1936 when he relocated to Austria in the hope of getting away from the oppression of Nazi Germany. But because of his Jewish background he was only marginally safer in Austria and as war became increasingly likely he managed to get out of Europe altogether and sail for the USA before the conflict began. There he taught at the Cooper Union in New York and simultaneously produced book illustrations on a freelance basis for several American publishers. Some of his illustrations featured in works of fiction and some in factual documentary books. Cradle developed a particularly strong professional relationship with George Mace's limited edition club and among his work for them was a six volume edition of the stories of Hans Christian Andersen the first of which was published in 1942 and which quickly sold out to wealthy collectors. And in 1944, he created a series of line-only monochromes of Shakespeare comedies and tragedies for several volumes published by Random House. But what really made his reputation in the USA was a commission to illustrate an edition of Grimm's Tales published in 1945. 
This book featured a number of line and wash colour pages and a vast amount of line only spot illustrations. And it was with these quite minimal calligraphic pen drawings that he really demonstrated just how visually expressive only a few well chosen lines could be. Cradle was exceptionally prolific at this time. And in 1946, he not only illustrated Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera HMS Pinafore, but also produced a remarkably distinctive series of colour pages and yet more expressive line-only spot illustrations for an edition of Carlo Collodi's Tale of Pinocchio, which generally stuck to the darker narrative of the original text. And as his success grew, he stayed with this winning graphic formula, and in 1947, he published his illustrated interpretation of Aesop's fables, another project tailor-made for his narrative abilities. This volume clearly demonstrated a particular affinity for creating anthropomorphised animal characters, while still keeping their essential anatomy and suggested movement highly plausible. In 1952, he had similar success with his visualisation of the adventures of Baron Munchausen, which was yet another book created for the Limited Editions Club. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, Cradle remained creatively active with various book projects for children and adults, including a 1954 edition of the Swiss Family Robinson, featuring many descriptive, visually absorbing line drawings. Among his later books, Cradle's edition of the world's best fairy tales, published by the Reader's Digest Association in 1967, proved particularly popular, and in the following year he returned to coloured woodcuts for a book of proverbs from around the world. His last work was for 1970's children's book, Elmo Doolan and the Search for the Golden Mouse, by Shirley Russo Murphy, and Fritz Cradle died in 1973, when he was 73 years old. British artist and illustrator Reginald John Whistler, who came to be known as Rex, was born into a prosperous middle-class family in Eltham, a few miles south of London in 1905. In his late teens he was accepted into the Royal Academy, but he disliked the regime there and left fairly soon after. He continued his studies at the Slade School of Art, where he was considerably happier, and this time he lasted the full duration of the course. Soon after leaving the Slade, he found success as an artist and was in particular demand for painting portraits and for the creation of murals, many of which were for stately homes. But his most noted mural in his early career was for the cafe at the Tate Gallery, which he completed in 1927, when he was only 22. He was also active, to a lesser degree, as an illustrator, and in 1928 he produced a highly memorable, humorous poster to attract visitors to the London Museum. And in the following year he created a similarly whimsical poster promoting the Tate Gallery. One of his earliest illustration successes was with a highly distinctive and deliberately retrospectively styled monochrome edition of Gulliver's Travels published in 1930 with the illustrations set within suitably ornate borders and frames. The overall effect was strongly suggestive of the 18th century engravings created by satirical artists such as William Hogarth. And by this point he was as much in demand for his illustration as his art and he featured regularly in magazines and designed several book covers for popular British authors. Simultaneously, more overtly commercial work came his way, including commissions for Guinness advertising press campaigns. And he was a particularly popular choice for marketing and publicity material for the prestigious department store Fortnum & Mason throughout the 1930s. He even combined art and illustration with a landscape painting which was used as a poster for Shell Oil in 1933. In 1935, he published a monochrome illustrated edition of the fairy tales of Hans Andersen, using the mock engraving style he'd already demonstrated a facility for with Gulliver's Travels. And he continued to enjoy success, including theatre costume and stage set work alongside his art career up to the outbreak of war in 1939. Whistler was eager to join the army and he was commissioned as an officer in the Welsh Guards. 
While fighting in France, he was killed in 1944 in a mortar explosion when he was 39 years old. But only two years later, a previously unseen collaboration with his brother Lawrence, a book of verses and comically grotesque upside-down faces was published. And in the coming years, other previously unpublished work by Whistler also came to light, including a comically engaging series of line and wash illustrations for the story of Mr. Cora, written by Christabel Aberconway. Why these books had not been published when he was alive, I have no idea. Despite Antonio Petrocelli's significant contribution to illustrative design, there is barely anything factual written about his life and work, so I'll try to get by with what little there is. He was born in Fort Lee, New Jersey in 1907, and at the age of 18 in 1925, with little significant art education, he started work as a textile designer. But in the later 20s he also created some cover art for House Beautiful magazine, and by 1932 he had gravitated to illustration. In 1933 he began working for the highly prestigious business magazine Fortune. And it was obvious from the images he created for their covers that he'd brought with him the principles he had exploited in his career in textiles, with a strong emphasis on pattern making and the use of diagonal composition. The vast majority of his images were essentially compelling illustrative designs, which were as much about abstraction as they were representation. An intuitive understanding of the dynamics of Italian futurism, combined with an Art Deco sensibility, were the defining characteristics of his work, and he saw no reason to try to conceal the underlying geometric construction. As well as his cover work, he featured regularly in the pages of the magazine, with interior illustrations and information graphics. And his relationship with Fortune endured between 1933 and 1945, with hundreds of images to his credit. Alongside his work for Fortune, he acquired other major clients from the publishing world along the way. Among them were The New Yorker and Colliers. His work for these publications in particular gave him an excuse to explore his more comedic side, which hadn't previously surfaced in his work for Fortune. But even his more overtly illustrative and figurative humorous work revealed the extent of his profound design sensibilities. Most frequently Petrocelli created his work with gouache paint, and also occasionally used an airbrush for tonal effects and he wasn't averse to the use of collage and other more obtuse methods either, and all these ingredients in varying quantities contributed to the enduring and visually fascinating quality of the images. His inventive diagrams, charts, maps and other graphics continued to feature regularly in other magazines, including Steel Horizons, an industrial publication for whom he produced several covers into the 1960s. But by the 1970s all trace of his work seems to have disappeared, but it's quite possible that around this time he simply retired. And he died in 1994 at the age of 87. I hope you've enjoyed this instalment of Distinctive Talents, and that you'll be back for more next time around. See you then.